But prior to that, as we read in Zechariah, God brings these uh, nations against Israel. And then we see that it's, it's at the end of this period called the uh, Tribulation, which is spoken of in the whole 24th chapter of the book of Matthew. If you turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 24, that whole chapter deals with the Tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we read this in Matthew 24, verse, starting with verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, right at the end of the seven years, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall give up her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, any time you read that in the scripture, the sun giving up its light, the moon giving, giving up its light, the stars falling from heaven, that is a sign of the second coming. You'll see it throughout the Old Testament. You'll see it throughout the New Testament. And verse 30 says, And when these signs appear, look, look what happens. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So the second coming of Jesus Christ initiates this battle. And we go on. The Antichrist will lead his 200 million men army. If you go back to the book of Revelation in chapter 9 verse 16, it gives you the number. And the number of the army of, of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. That's 200 million. And I heard the number of theirs thereof. The Antichrist will lead his 200 million men army into the valley of Midigo. His plan will be to attack Israel. And the reason he will attack Israel is uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, we read this. Let no man deceive you in any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin, the Antichrist, be revealed. The son of perdition. 2 Corinthians, uh, sorry, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, states the reason why the Antichrist will attack Israel. Who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he had God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist is going to go into the temple of Jerusalem and declare himself God. And that will uh, do it for Israel. They will break the covenant, the peace agreement they signed with him. They will have nothing to do with him. And what will happen is, the Antichrist will lead his, uh, his army against Jerusalem. And once and for all, try to settle the Jewish question. As you will soon see, it won't be much of a contest. Again, in Zechariah 14, 1, we, we speak about the day of the Lord cometh when God shall bring the, all the nations of the world against Israel. And as I've said in uh, prior lessons, you can see Israel being isolated today. There are certain organizations in this country that are uh, making an effort to divest themselves of any investment in Israel at all. Israel is being blamed just about for any problem that's in the world today. This little country of two and a half million standing against the Arabs, over 200 million people, and Israel is being blamed for everything, for all the problems in the world. Oh, the poor Palestinians. Listen, those Arab countries could absorb those Palestinians with no problem at all. And the reason they don't is they need an excuse to uh, give, uh, give Israel a hard time, as it were, to uh, try to portray Israel as an aggressor when it's not Israel that's an aggressor at all. Israel is the only democracy in that whole region. Israel is the only place where you can vote, where you can practice the religion you want. You can't do that in those other Arab countries. So as I said, Israel, even today, there's an attempt to isolate it. The UN, uh, in the Arab countries, even in the press of America, they will always take the part of the Palestinians and always try to make Israel look bad. But my friend, they're wasting their time. Because it's not going to happen. Zechariah 4 2 says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. And Zechariah 14 3 says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as he when he fought in the day of battle. Jesus Christ is going to come back and fight against those nations that go against Israel. And it's not going to be much of a battle, as we will see. We read in Revelation 19, 11, 
And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. In Revelation 19.11, the skies open, and Jesus Christ comes back, sitting upon a white horse, leading his army. Now I know there are many of you out there who think this is all fantasy. And that's exactly what Satan wants you to think. You see, Satan wants you to think that this is all fairy tales. Um, if you look at what passes for entertainment today in movies and on TV, the human race is being desensitized. Look at some of these, quote, science fiction programs, science fiction movies. You'll, you'll see the most base, degenerate, depraved things going on. That's to desensitize you to what's really coming. Now, God has put in his word these prophecies, and these things are going to happen. And the reason he puts them there is to warn you. And you have a choice, my friend. You can either believe what God has said because it's going to come to pass, or you can reject it. And there will be eternal consequences for you rejecting it. As a matter of fact, as we will read a little farther on, God's going to let you think that you, you got it right. So in Revelation 19.11, we see the sky opening, Jesus Christ coming back. And it says to judge and to make war. As we have said in the previous lessons, he's going to come back, destroy the Antichrist and his armies, and then bring the nations that are left to stand before him in Jerusalem, and he's going to judge the nations. And what will determine whether you go into the millennium or whether you go into the lake of fire will it will be determined by how you treated Israel, how you treated the Jew. Remember, remember those, those promises that God made to Abraham back there in Genesis chapter 12. Seven promises. And two of those promises were, whoever blesses Abraham's seed, God will bless. Whoever curses Abraham's seed, God will curse. Very plain. Go back and look in chapter 12 of Genesis and those seven promises that God makes. And that's what will determine who passes into the millennium and who is cast into the lake of fire. This, my friend, is not a very pleasant thought. So we see in Revelation 19, 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horse, Jesus Christ, clothed with fine linen, white and clean. That army will consist of all the saved from, from the ages, from all ages. Those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ from the time of the crucifixion to the present time. Or to the very last uh, person who trusts Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ's church is complete, we're gone. We're out of here. But we're coming back. We're coming back with him as it says, states in Revelation 19, 16. His armies. He's bringing back his armies. Clothed in fine linen. That fine linen represents the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is imputed to those that trust Him as the Lord and Savior. And imputation, the doctrine of imputation, being with, credited with something that uh, doesn't belong to you, being uh, given credit for something that you had nothing to do with. And that's explained in this, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. As I said before, you won't be able to boast. You will be either imputed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, or you'll stand before God in your own righteousness, which he calls filthy rags. And I don't have to draw a picture of what will come next for you, my friend. Not a very pleasant picture, but it's the truth. And this is what we want you to know. What saith the scripture? God is warning you beforehand to see what's going to happen. These, these things are not fantasy. These are prophecies put in the Word of God, and they are going to come to pass as sure as I am standing here in front of you. So we see his armies coming back. And it gets better if you're saved. If you're not saved, uh, it doesn't get much, much better for you. We see 2 Thessalonians. Now how is he going to accomplish this? Well, 2 Thessalonians. In the second epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul writes something. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, starting with verse 7. And Paul writes this. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. 
when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, speaking of the second coming. Now this is what he says. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Taking flaming fire. He talks about fire. You know, in the days of Noah, because of the sinfulness and wickedness of man, God destroyed them with water. But this time, it's fire. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. On who? That obey, uh, that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You do not obey that gospel. You do not believe that gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 3. If you do not obey that gospel and receive Christ as your Savior, this is what's waiting for you. Not a very pleasant picture, but my friend, again, it's the truth. Again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with verse 7. This is what it says. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. It's taking place right now as we speak. Only he that let us will let until he be taken out of the way. Who is this that's going to be taken out of the way? The church of Jesus Christ. The catching up. They'll be taken up. And this will initiate the seven year tribulation. Just think of it. This world is going to get what it's always wanted. No, no God. No God interfering in your life. No God condemning their sin. It's going to be seven years like it's never been before. It's going to be depravity and wickedness and violence as was never took place on this earth before. My friend, my, my advice is to you is to try to avoid this because it's not going to be like anything that's ever happened before. And there's only one way to do it, and that's receive Christ as your Savior. And we go on. And then shall the wicked be revealed, the Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. My friend, people are going to be deceived because he's going to have signs and he's going to do wonders. The Bible calls them lying wonders. And the world is going to be deceived by this man. And we go on. And with all the secretness of unrighteousness and them that perish. And this is why you're going to perish if you trust not Jesus Christ. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Yes, my friend, you don't receive the love of the truth. Listen what God's got in store for you. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. God's going to let you think that everything's all right. He's going to send you this strong delusion. You're going to believe these signs and these wonders by the Antichrist. And it's all over for you. It's, your, your faith is sealed. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion and then they believe a lie. You know why? You say, well, if God is unjust, no. He's giving you the desires of your heart. You want to believe that. You want to believe the Antichrist. You don't want to believe God. And that's, and that's the truth. That's the problem with people today. Their pride. They don't want to believe what God says. They want to go their own way. They want to be able to control God instead of God controlling them. Well, you and the view of the audience are not going to happen that way. You're being warned. Take heed. Verse 12, that they may all be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. You have people today that just enjoy being drunk, that just enjoy stealing and being dishonest. They enjoy it. Fornication, lasciviousness, adultery. They enjoy it. They take pleasure in it. The Bible says they take pleasure in it. And woe unto you that take pleasure in it. Again, for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they may believe a lie. My friend, I would suggest that you do your best to avoid that. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if you do trust Christ as your Savior, you have the promise that you'll be taken out before these things happen. Just as Noah was put in the ark and avoided God's wrath in the flood, you'll be taken out and avoid the wrath of God that's coming on this world. As he judges the world for 6,000 years of sin and wickedness and rebellion. The scriptures are replete about this word when I'm again. It's not very pretty. Isaiah chapter 30. We'll start with Isaiah chapter 30. 
And this is what we read in Isaiah chapter 30, starting with verse 28. Listen to what it says. Pick it up from 27. Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire. And his breath as an overflowing stream shall reach into the midst of the neck to stiff the nations with the sieve of vanity. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. It speaks again of fire. Fire. God kindling the fire with his very breath. As it were, a human blowtorch. More devastating, more powerful than anything that's ever seen in the earth. Compared to this, an atomic bomb is going to look like a firecracker. We go to Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33. And we read this. For a tophet is ordained of old. Yea, for the king is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. And the breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. He speaks. And out of his breath comes fire. And that's how he's going to kindle it. And it's not going to be very pretty for you out there in the listening audience. He's going to shift the nations as a sieve of vanity. Isaiah 34. We go to the 34th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Starting with the, the ninth verse. And this is what we read. Rise up, ye women that are at ease. Hear, hear my voice, ye careless daughters. Give ear unto my speech. Many days... And here shall ye be troubled, ye careless women, for the vintage shall fail, the gathering shall uh, not come. Tremble, ye women that are at ease, be trembled, ye careless ones, strip you and make you bear, and gird sackcloth upon your loins, that ye may lament for the teeth, for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. And it speaks about judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful place. This is what's going to happen. Uh, there are many other verses dealing with the battle of Armageddon. Isaiah 33, 11 through 14. Isaiah 10, 16 through 7. Isaiah 11, chapter uh, 11, verse 4. Amos, chapter 1, 12, talks about a fire upon Teman. Isaiah 29, 5 and 7. Psalms 97. Go to the Psalms 97, the book of Psalms, chapter 97. The book of Psalms, chapter 97. And we read this. Psalms 97, 3. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. It speaks about a fire going before him and burning up his enemies. That's how he will destroy the Antichrist army. With fire. He breathes, it goes out and consumes them. Uh, Psalms chapter 50. The 50th chapter of the book of Psalms. That throughout the Old Testament, throughout the whole Old Testament, we read about this fire. Psalms 50, verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He comes, he defeats the Antichrist army by just breathing fire on speaking it into, into creation. And that fire will burn forever and ever, it says in the book of Revelation. And the smoke of their tor torment uh, ascends up to heaven forever. Not a very pretty picture. But that's what the scripture says. A fire will go before them. This battle of Armageddon will be like nothing you have ever seen. Let me tell you something. The first Gulf War, that's going to look like a cakewalk compared to this thing. But it's going to take place, my friend. You can scoff at it, you can say, I don't believe it. But there's going to come a judgment day when the holy, righteous, just God will come and judge the world. Fight against the Antichrist and his army. And this battle is called the Battle of Armageddon. And it's fought in the Valley of Midigal, right outside Jerusalem. And it's going to be like nothing, nothing you've ever seen. How do you avoid this? Well, there's only one way. And you've been hearing, hearing it from us for the last 13 weeks, and we will continue to just tell you the truth. The Philippian jailer said to Paul, the apostle, what must I do to be saved? Saved from what? Saved from what we were just talking about. 
the judgment and the wrath of Almighty God. And Paul looks at him and says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You see, you out there in the view regarding this, salvation is in a person. It's not in a religion. It's not in good works. It's not in sacraments. It's not in ceremonies. It's in a person. That person was sinless. That person was God manifest in the flesh. Is still God manifest in the flesh, sitting at the right hand of God, making intercession for the saints. And that person will always be, forevermore, God manifested in the flesh. And he came to earth and led a perfect life for 33 and a half years. And then was nailed to a cross. You see, this was all ordained by God before the foundation of the earth. He wanted to, he knew man would sin and fall into sin and he knew he would judge them. And God's desire was to reconcile you back to him. This was planned out before God ever created man or the world. You see, God wasn't caught off guard. God wasn't surprised about anything and has never been surprised. He knew exactly what would happen. And he made a way to escape. The Lord Jesus Christ took your sin and my sin. What should have been done to us was done to him. The sinless, perfect, complete Lamb of God took your sin, took my sin. But friends, it will be of no avail to you unless you accept it. It will be no avail to you unless you call upon the Lord. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says in the book of Acts, repentance towards God, to turn and forsake your sin, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is in a nutshell. And my friend, your eternal destiny will be determined by one thing and one thing only. You either believe what God says or you don't believe what God says. And that will determine your eternal destiny. So we here at Bethlehem Baptist Church extend to you the invitation. Receive Jesus Christ as the Savior. Call upon the name of the Lord and repent of your sins. And God's promise is that you'll be eternally saved and uh, live with him in heaven for all eternity. May the Lord bless you and lead you into all truth. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.